In this episode, we're going to talk about the physical attributes that you can train to get better at any sport. All right. Are you qualified yeah, to talk yeah. about this? This is good. I got you guys with me. <laughs> Absolutely. We got you back. Yeah. This is good. No, you know, I think uh, first thing is first. I think um, because people are listening to this episode, I made this mistake uh, when I did, when I was a wrestler, did jujitsu or judo, is I would look at physical attributes and I'll put them above learning the skill or technique. Uh, that's always at the top. So I just want to say that, right? Like, especially if you're... If you're, you know, getting started or you're a, a teenage athlete or college athlete, um, you practicing the sport is always going to be one of the best ways to get better at your sport. Uh, but there are physical attributes you could train outside of training for your sport that contribute, tend to contribute to pretty much any athletic endeavor. Now, you didn't put these in any specific order because I'm looking at it going like I probably would place number three, number one. Sure. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we can, I think we should try and, and – or because here's a – like I wish I understood this. Um, I did understand that playing my sport would get me better at my sport. And yeah. so I, that's what I did mostly, but I put little to no emphasis around training. Mm -hmm. And I think that in one where I grew up small town, there wasn't like an athletic trainer that had any sort of serious background or knowledge, like the coach. I remember like the, the exercises and stuff that he had us doing inside the mm. weight room were yeah. like terrible. They were not exercises that were going to translate into it's the probably court. all bodybuilder focused. Yeah, they were the like calf exercises. Do like, cause yeah. we were basketball players. So back then, back then it was like strength shoe, yeah. you oh, know, yeah, era. Yeah. And so it was like just lots of calf raises. Yeah. So if you want to jump higher and run mm -hmm. faster, calf raises, like that was the stuff that we were doing calf raises and leg press and like BS stuff like that. It wasn't until I was in my, I would say early twenties. It was like 22 Long, long done playing sports like at least like with a like a team or whatever i still played like rec ball and uh, i had actually kind of taken a break from playing a lot of basketball and was now on my like bodybuilder type of kick i was building to, to, to look good like build muscle and i in fact i used to say like all show no go mm -hmm. but yet i come out to play basketball one day and i hadn't played in a long time and i throw the ball down better than i had ever had it in my life and i remember like afterward landing going like Oh my God, like I haven't played basketball in like a year. Where did that come from? Well, it came from all the squatting. All the training. Yeah. Yeah. All the squatting that I was doing that I hadn't done previously. Had I known that, I would have been a lot further. It's really taken the um, strength community a long time to establish um, that thought because there was still a lot of like muscle bound um, theory out there. If you were to weight train, it was going to make you slower, it's going to restrict movement. It was. Uh, going to do all these things that we're actually limiting with your sport. And so for programs to actually adopt real solid strength training and build that foundation with their athletes, it's actually like only fairly recently where um, coaches are incorporating that, making that a big priority. I think what also perpetuated that, Justin, and you correct me if you think otherwise, is that we always tend to do the extreme of everything too. Mm -hmm. So it's like you would think strength training, you don't think like adding a few pounds of muscle or just focusing on your strength. You think of like gaining 10, 20 pounds of muscle. Mm -hmm. And so if you take an athlete – who's been like me, he was playing basketball most of his life. And all of a sudden you slap on, you know, 30 pounds of muscle and you're just focused on building muscle. Like, okay, it might hinder yeah. my game, but there's a, a much more methodical approach to building strength and muscle to that athletic frame that mm -hmm. could actually enhance well, the, my game. The other thing too, is in the past, people <clears throat> would look at bodybuilders and they would judge the bodybuilders right. on their athletic performance. So they'd say, Oh look, there's that 240 pound bodybuilder. Let's watch him play basketball. Yeah, and, yeah. and maybe the guy never played basketball. <laughs> right, he never right. practiced as a kid. It's not a sport he enjoys. So then they'd watch him play and they'd be like, oh, it's he's big and muscle bound. He's not fast. Well, the guy never plays basketball. Yeah, and they're doing half reps in the gym as well. Like the training is completely different. Right, right. Now, uh, something also to consider here is whenever you're training outside of your sport, you always have to balance out your training volume. Meaning if you're practice and you, let's say you're going five days a week to practice and you're like you're recovering but you know you're at the limit like you're pushing it and you're going hard don't think to, that it's a good idea then to add three additional days of strength training based off of this episode because all you're going to do is compromise your body's ability to recover and you'll reduce your performance there's always a balance of volume of training so this what we're about to talk about has to improve your ability to practice, not take away from your ability to practice. And you have to balance those. So you can't do everything all at once because the body doesn't doesn't you know react that way. Speaking of that, not to get off subject, but you just reminded me of something that I asked a long time ago. Did you guys ever watch the documentary on, on the Balco trainer? 
Yes. Did you, you guys end up watching that? That yeah. was the, the one of the most impressive yeah, things about that documentary for me was the the way he scheduled and trained the volume, like mm -hmm. the how scientific yes. he was about the approach of recovery and volume and like putting that much. Like I know, it, like obviously. Uh, you know, his name got drugged through the mud because of the scandal with Barry Bonds mm -hmm. and all the stuff with the steroids and everything like that. And I'm sure a lot of people just immediately discredit him. But as a trainer, looking at his programming and the the scientific approach, I, I put more on the programming than the, than the so, steroids. The, um, the, so okay, so my buddies and I got into this big old they controversial. Drugs. Oh yeah, uh -huh. they're like all all drugs. They weren't impressed at all. And I'm like, oh, you guys have no idea. Like, you guys see what he was tracking and what he was paying attention to yeah. mm -hmm. that detail was incredible and like he was going to improve those athletes no matter what ba drugs or no drugs balancing volume for athletes is so <clears throat> important because this is what athletes tend to do okay athletes will they'll, they'll they're practicing four or five days a week then they'll hear an episode like this and they'll say oh cool mobility strength yeah. speed power add whatever this on top of everything I'm gonna, I'm doing. yes i'm going to train for all that now so now they they'll they'll stay past practice for an hour and a half and they'll also work out on saturday and sundays and then they'll wonder why their performance is decreasing Mm -hmm. why they feel stiff or sore or injuries continue to pop up. So everything that we're about to talk about has to be balanced appropriately. And your best approach is to focus on one at a time, not to throw everything but the kitchen sink at yourself because the body doesn't adapt well that way. So as we go through these, I think it's important and we'll describe them all and explain uh, you know, how they contribute. But as we go through them, pick the one that you think is going to give you the most bang for your buck. Um, and there's going to be one here that I know is most is probably most applicable for most people, but not for everybody. Pick that one and then work on it. And, and don't just add a bunch of volume if you're already training close to your limit. If you're already training close to your limit, you have to take something away in order to add more to get your body uh, to respond. Yep. Today's YouTube giveaway is the Super Bundle. Here's how you can win that. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, these are the final hours for the MAPS Performance Advanced launch right now because it's a brand new launch. And if you're catching this when we drop it, you can get it for $80 off. Plus, you can get the two free ebooks included, uh, the Grip Strength Reference Guide and Eat for Performance. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. So the first attribute, and this one is almost never considered among athletes. And that's why I put this one at the top. Not because it's the most important, but because it's one that they just people just don't tend to consider it. And that's to improve mobility. Yeah. If you improve your mobility, so mobility is defined as your joints ability to express itself fully through its fullest range of motion with, with control and strength. Okay. So not like mobility does not mean you're flexible. Flexibility is a component of mobility. Mobility means you are not only flexible, but you own the entire range of motion. So not only can you do the splits, but if you need to jump out of the splits, you could. Or if somebody jumped on top of you while you're in the splits, you wouldn't hurt yourself, for example. Mobility is what will allow you to perform better on the field or on the court because now whatever strength you have, you have now extended its range of motion. So however far you reach or rotate or throw or punch or whatever, you've now increased the capacity to do so by improving mobility. This is a very simple way, especially with older athletes, a very a very very specific way and effective way to improve athletic performance. Yeah, another way to say is like end range strength and so yeah. it's not just um that that main uh, range of motion that you're strongest in, which a lot of athletes they stay there, they stay in that comfortable range when whether they're lifting weights or they're practicing specific movements um they're they're practicing just what they feel strong and and capable well this is extending that and, and really broadening uh your base in terms of if you're in a position with your body can i uh conjure up strength and stability and support in order for me to move out or sustain this position. And so that's, yes. that's a huge component to all aspects of sports. Have you ever seen, I know you guys have, but you look at pictures of um, high level basketball players or tennis players when they're changing directions and you look at the angle of their ankle. Oh yeah. yeah. When they're, when they're going sideways, their shin. They're, I mean, they're, they, I mean, Looks they're like foot, it's gonna rip off. I Paul, would, I, yeah. I would roll my ankle. Yeah. Paul Fabris does cool videos. I've shouted him out before on the, on the show many times of that exact, the shin angle yeah. of some of these. I That's mean, mobility. There's, 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 yep. he's got examples of like some of these NBA players 
where and he's frozen the camera yeah and their ankle is, is <laughs> flat like this and their shin is literally like almost parallel it's like it's snapping to the yeah. floor yeah. it's yeah. in unbelievable and that's mobility they have that's the right. flexibility to move that yeah. way but they also have the strength to prevent themselves yeah they're still in control yeah, yeah. they're not hurting themselves yeah. it reminds me of if you ever watched uh like uh motorcycle racing and you ever watch them go around a turn and the guy's laying the bike sideways yeah and the tires are still keeping contact and they're able to make those turns in, or, in order to be able to be agile and perform, if you have greater mobility, I mean, you're going to have an advantage over your opponent. So mobility is a very, and, and the great thing about mobility is training mobility doesn't hammer the body that much. This is, of all the stuff we're going to talk about, mobility is the one that you could probably add yeah. to your well, training and not overtrain. Just to reinforce that. So when I did that um, uh, reunion football game, and this was something right. I was like, you know, 40 years old already, all the guys out there as well, uh, and Full had contact. a limited time to train for it. I had like two weeks. And uh, of course, the other team, they took a full year, but you know, we're not going to talk about that. Um, so what do we do? I'm like conditioning. That's a big consideration because I'm going to get tired and I'm going to be dogging it out there. But I put most of my focus into mobility and to really, you know, get the guys on board in terms of like, if I'm moving out there, the biggest thing is to be able to create and generate force and power in those, in those different positions, but also to be protected and stable. Uh, so we weren't getting hurt in it was the best thing we could have done. It just, it allowed guys to move and still like remain, uh, keep their athleticism uh, because their body was able to respond in those different mm. angles. It, the, 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 the time that you noticed, I guess the most is when you're not athletic is when you're in an unfamiliar position. Yes. And so your body your actually, you know, you, you feel weak. Like yeah. honestly, you, you get that shaky feeling mm -hmm. sometimes when you're doing something you're unfamiliar with. Um, and that's really like what I noticed was that as long as we were kind of training and, and rotating and moving laterally and, and reinforcing a lot of these positions, um, when we went full speed out on the field, there was no problem. You know, yeah. even though I wouldn't list this as the first and the foundational, you know, of the five, I, I do like talking about it first because I think this is of all the ones that we're going to talk about, I think the we 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 knew the least about this, right? Or mm -hmm. we've we were learning still so much more. Like for example, we were we were talking about basketball, and it wasn't that long ago that we used to on our on our NBA players wear high top shoes, yeah, mm -hmm. and restrict the ankle mobility in, in order to try and protect the ankles. The logic and the theory back then was the you wanted was these, more injuries. Yes, you wanted these high top shoes and you wanted to tighten them like that to help help brace them. But there actually was more ankle injuries than they are now. And now a lot of the guys most here and you remember seeing this like Kobe was one of the first shoes that were low top shoes. Now almost every NBA player will normally wear that unless he's nursing an injury for the most part will wear low top shoes mm -hmm. because you want that ankle that mobility, travel, but we yeah. didn't train that. We didn't think to yeah. like stretch those limits so that they could handle that. And now when you look at the game, like look at these movements, how much more dynamic these, these athletes are able to do it today versus just say 20 years yeah. ago. So, so how would you work on mobility, right? Mobility would be moving through uh, ranges of motion that challenge you while staying connected to that range of motion mm -hmm. by creating while contracting tension. your muscle. Here's support. an example. This is not a mobility. What I'm about to say is not a mobility uh, movement, but it's an example of what I'm trying <clears throat> to say. So the difference between flexibility and mobility here would be Flexibility would be I'm going down to touch my toes and I relax and wait for my hamstrings to stretch. That's flexibility. Mobility would be a Romanian deadlift where I'm going down with resistance, stretching my hamstrings coming up. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm strengthening the hamstring throughout its full range of motion and challenging that range of motion. Now, I wouldn't consider a Romanian deadlift a classic mobility exercise, but it's just to illustrate what I'm talking about. So 90, 90, you know, um, you know, stick dislocates, uh, handcuff with rotation. These are all movements we've had. We've, we mm -hmm. can put links here that we filmed, um, on our other YouTube channel, but it's about staying connected through these ranges of motion so that you own longer and greater ranges of motion and thus improve your mobility, which reduces risk of injury, but also improves performance. Well, I'm glad you use that, even though maybe it's not a classic example of a mobility exercise. It's still a, the point you're trying to make that I think is so important here 
is a lot of people hear the word mobility and they think flexibility. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then they go, oh, well, I do, I take yoga three times right, a week, right, right. or I always stretch before practice, or I always stretch after practice, or I'm pretty limber, I can touch my toes. It's like, there's a difference between having flexibility and then having mobility. And having mobility is having strength and control through those full right. range of motion. And, that, and a lot of strength and control, that's like those athletes, like it's not like they just stretch the ankles out to where they can get to that angle no. they're getting strong in those a good example of that our our other good friend uh cory schlesinger remember his uh um his um is what do you call his ramp i should give him oh, a shot uh, yeah, yeah, the angled ramp yeah his ang angled ramp but that squats on it. i mean i love seeing that that was new like yeah. that we weren't doing that 15 years no, ago no. like we weren't doing that with pro athletes Still new, that. Yeah. and so now you have these these coat or these trainers that are training these pro athletes that understand that it's not just them having this flexibility or their ankles the ability for the right. ankle to roll or move that way but actually good control and strength and that so we're going to train it we're going to load it we're going to do explosive movements off of it so it's not just well being flexible and able to touch well, toes and stuff like almost that. every sport i can think of is dynamic it's mm -hmm. not stationary flat you know maybe powerlifting right <laughs> but the, the, no other sport like every other sport includes uh, a dynamic component this next one is about becoming more stable so stability in particular and i'm speaking more specifically but this this really relates to all the joints but let's i want to speak more specifically to the spine creating stability around the spine allows my limbs and my, my body to move and exert power while my spine, which is a just, there's a ton of joints along your spine. If you look at your spine, it's a bunch of bony, you know, uh, plates with discs in between. Each one of those is a joint. Each one of those can rotate, flex, and extend. And you want to be able to have them do that, but you want them to also be so stable so that you don't move to an end range of motion that injures you while you're throwing or, or, or punching or kicking or running or turning. Mm -hmm. So developing stability means being strong and stable. It means doing exercises like counter rotation type movements where you're not just trying to move in a direction, but you're actually resisting moving in a direction. And you want to have that kind of stability that, that whether I'm rotated twists, what I'm jumping, I can keep my spine in a, in a position where it's, where it's yeah. strong and stable. You can own your space. You can create that kind of control. I look at it as like uh, creating more torque and power, uh, more, more force production. So uh, look at somebody who's on roller skates uh, trying to do a golf swing versus somebody yes. who's like super grounded and, and anchored to the ground, allowing rotation, but can generate more power and force because they have that ability to really uh, stabilize their entire body when they need to. Well, this, yeah. I mean, this highlights the importance of the, the core. I mean, this used, this takes me all the way back to my original days as a trainer. So my first like, you know, introduction to becoming a trainer and like learning something that mm -hmm. I didn't know ahead of time was like core and like the value of the core. And I used to have this like whole presentation of, you know, I would show people, I'd have a pen and I'd have the pen sitting in my hand like this, right? And I'd be like, this is most people, your core wraps around your spine like this. And most people have a very unstable, weak core. And so I'd show the, demonstrate the pen, mm. being able to move all the way around. And it's like, look how unstable, weak you are. You're open for injury like this. You're not going to be very strong like this. Now imagine if we strengthen these muscles and then I would tighten it up to where the, the now mm. the, the spine is nice and stable. The amount of force that you can generate, how protected and object. safe you are, how quick you can move, how quick you can react. And I said, and this is the most important muscle in your body beside your heart. Obviously your heart, without it, you're dead. But the next most important muscle in your body is these core muscles that wrap around this spine. And that's the foundation to this. If you do not have this stable core that you can you can hold that foundation on that spine and then you're asking these limbs to do all this dynamic stuff like you're gonna lose your body will limit you you'll lose power no try your to power take, will leak out try to take off uh while being in sand versus uh being <clears throat> on on asphalt like you're gonna take off way faster with that stable surface versus sand which is not very stable yep so core stability and stability in general by the way the best way to train this is isometrics yep. isometrics are incredible at developing stability now here's the thing with isometrics people tend to forget two things. One, nobody does them, which is stupid. Isometrics training. By the way, I talked about how mobility could probably be added to your routine without really compromising your recovery. Isometrics. Too. Isometrics will compromise your recovery more so than mobility, but still not a ton. So isometrics is another thing you can add. So number one, nobody does them, which is dumb because isometrics have tremendous, in a short period of time, here's what's beautiful about isometrics. Huge carryover. Is that in a four week period of time, you could dramatically improve your stability through isometrics. It, it's of all the muscle contractions, this one produces 
strength gains the fastest in that particular uh, avenue. So isometrics are phenomenal. Here's the mistake that a lot of people make is they'll train an isometric in one position. Don't train the other positions. So in other words, a common isometric would be like a overhead hold. That's a good isometric hold, but I can also train it where I'm holding down here halfway or down here at the very bottom. You want to train different positions to build stability in different positions. And this is true for the core or for the shoulders or for the hips, all these dynamic joints. And it'll it just improve your performance. Yep. Next up, this one's, I think, I don't think we need to make this argument, but just get stronger. This is the foundation. <coughs> in yeah. my opinion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is like if you- If were... anybody gets stronger, they're going to be better. Yeah. yeah. Just across the board. And it contributes to every physical, uh, any physical pursuit. The only, and, I, and I'll say this, and, and I, I'm saying this carefully because I don't want to send the wrong message, but the only time getting stronger would be a problem is if you got so much stronger that you no longer were used to your own body. And the reason why I'm saying that is I've seen kids, this is not common as you get older, but I've seen kids play a sport in the summer, gain tons of strength, go back to playing the sport, all of a sudden can't throw the same accuracy that you can't. That was my point I was bringing up to Justin earlier. Is like, yeah. I think the reason why there's that, I think that's been perpetuated for so many years is because we tend to go to the extremes. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody hears that, oh, getting stronger is, so they take the whole off season to pack on 30 now pounds. They have a new body. And they didn't maintain the actual mechanics, the skills. They didn't. They weren't disciplined with the practice of that particular movement for the sport on top of training. Yeah. So it's like they just dismissed that and just went all in on building uh, mass and strength. I mean, it's very, it's very much so the opposite of body building we do not care about size like you, you don't want you like in fact i just want to get stronger if i can keep the scale the same or barely go that up, would be the best yes if i can get an athlete to get stronger in the gym lifting more weight and we don't really go up on the scale or very minimally we go up on the scale that's a huge win i'm Strength. not looking for 20 pounds yes. added to the scale over a summer break like then they're 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 most likely not going to be moving the same. You know, a classic example of this and and my favorite sport to watch is the NBA, which is wa watching the growth of Stephen Curry over the last fourteen years of his career. Like to the average eye, he probably looks very similar to what he looked like say ten years ago. But I mean, I've been watching him play. Like he's just barely put on a little bit of muscle, mm. and the difference of how he can play the game today versus what he was. Like mm. he used to be known as this player. That everybody, the whole, the, they would scheme against him because he couldn't guard anyone because he was physically weak. Yes, he could shoot the lights out. Yes, he could hand the ball, but defensively, anybody could bully ball him where you can't do that to him anymore. And that's because he's gotten stronger over all these years, but he didn't put on this crazy amount of size where the next year everybody went like, oh my God, he put on all this weight, all this size. Str strength to weight ratio mat matters a lot. And there are some sports where, where weight matters as well. Football being an example, <laughs> right? If you're hitting someone yep. and there's more kinetic energy because you're heavier, it's better. But if your strength to weight ratio gets really thrown off now you're just a weight on the field you're just a blob you can't move so you still need to consider strength to weight ratio what does that mean okay so if you gained you know 30 pounds of muscle um you're going to want to at least be at third as strong as you are now but in relation to the 30 pounds in terms of the ratio meaning go it needs to match or better, you have a better strength to weight ratio is what you're yeah. looking for. Otherwise, it'll slow you down. But strength ultimately at the end, especially in the beginning, by the way, especially for younger athletes, this is the this is the foundation. Like if you take a young athlete, a high school athlete, and you just make them stronger, they'll get better. If you're an adult athlete and you do no strength training whatsoever and you play on the weekends and you add one day a week of squats or deadlifts or overhead presses, yeah. you watch your performance. They're more improve. resilient to shearing forces. They have more longevity uh, in their gameplay. There's just so many more benefits to getting stronger for these younger athletes that I think a lot of coaches like dismiss some of these like uh, huge facts. It's like we need we need more uh, emphasis on strength training in order to build better athletes. I mean, you can simultaneously work on their skills. There's a way to do that. Um, they just have to be a little bit more educated with their programming. I, you know, I think it's important to kind of illustrate what you just said because I think this is so important. So, for example, if you had a 150-pound kid who could squat 300 pounds – if they got up to 200 pounds, they better be doing north of 400 pounds right. squat. For, for the same to, ratio. For it to make even close to sense. Because even if it was just 400 pounds and it's exactly the same ratio and you just got heavier, you're yeah. not going to be a better athlete. Yeah. Right. You're going to that you're gonna have to improve your strength to, rate, strength to weight ratio, especially if you went up in weight like and you that. You can control that too with nutrition. That's I mean, right. A lot of the, yeah. the, the massive gains, like you can taper that a bit and still receive a lot of strength gains, but not gain 
so much mass. Yeah, the best exercises for this are your conventional deadlift, squat, overhead press, bench press, row, your split stance exercises like your lunges, your Bulgarian split stance squats, hip thrusts in some cases will have some good uh, some good carryover. Just your conventional strength training exercises, barbell and dumbbell will give you this this the strength that you're looking for. I, for I love things like Bulgarians for like your athletes. Just, you know, one, one of the things too, when you talk about mobility is the ability to, to flex and extend the hips yeah. is mm -hmm. so important. Yep. You're, so you're training that mobility in there. You're training the strength. There's in there. stability involved. Yeah. Too. There's stability that's involved in there. Like those, at, like, the, at, which is why people like, who's a Mike Boyle, who's the one who always talks about never doing always bilateral, doing stance, yeah, yeah, all unilateral work. That's why you, I think that's why he makes such a good case for training that way as an, an athlete because you're getting you're hitting three of those components that we always talk yeah. about we talk about right now. now next up is to get more powerful all right what's the difference between power and strength strength is your ability to lift something heavy power is your ability to lift things quickly yep. to contract your muscles fast this is explosivity right so this is the difference between an olympic lifter and a power lifter a power lifter has got a lot of strength not as much power a po an olympic lifter has got lots of of power. In fact, I've. Have you guys ever? Yes. So, have you ever ever <laughs> seen so Olympic lifters you jump? The name? Mm -hmm. I know because the name is powerlifter, so it's like it's. It should be strength lifter. You know, it, no, like it that. should yeah. be yeah. like because you think powerlifter and you think that's like that would be the default answer to no. like who generates yeah, the most max power. strength lifter or something. Yeah, yeah. No, it should be yeah. now rebranded. Now power is the way strength uh, looks on in a sport. Like power is at the end of the day what matters. Now you can't have a lot of power if you don't have a lot of strength. So somebody listening is like, I'm just going to train for power. You want to have a foundation of strength. And stability, too. And stability. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to move, move I mean, quickly at all. I, the way we explain always, power is the greatest expression of all the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like the, all the others come first, and then then power is the greatest expression of all that. Otherwise, you, if you are training power and you have poor stability, you have poor strength, you're not going to get, you're not going to generate very much power. Now, the difference in training for strength and power, obviously with power, you're lifting things quickly. Mm -hmm. But fatigue should play zero role in power training. Whereas in strength training, fatigue plays somewhat of a role. Like if I'm bench pressing for six reps, yeah. that sixth rep is going to be pretty hard. I'm going to feel like maybe I could do seven or eight and I'll stop at six. But there's some fatigue there. With power training, each time I do a jump box, each time I do a sprint or a clean, I should feel fully yeah, fresh and rested fully with every recovered. rep. With, yeah, I, I need to be able to do it as hard and fast as possible each time not do it and, and have fatigue uh, step in. Otherwise, it turns into stamina or at your at the best strength training and not power training. So Yeah, it's more beneficial to structure um, power exercises with less reps, obviously. And this is yes. one of those things. So you can be very hyper-focused. It's, it's, it requires a lot more moving parts all to work simultaneously, uh, instantaneously. And so... Uh, it, as opposed to, to strength, where you can kind of gradually bring everything uh, together to to pull the the movement off. This is explosively immediate, and so it, it requires uh, just a lot of output, which you need to recover from. Maybe one of my biggest pet peeves as a trainer. Um, I think that power exercises have been bastardized the most by trainers. One hundred percent. You never see it. In it's always a key indicator for me if the, I've got myself a really good experienced, knowledgeable trainer in my gym or in the gym that I'm at, uh, observing someone training a, a kid or an athlete uh, in power mm -hmm. and doing it correctly. Rarely ever do you ever see it. You see it done in circuits all the time. Yep. You see it done to fatigue all the time. You see it with lots of repetitions, five, six, 10, 15 repetitions, yep. doing these explosive type movements. It's like, it's like a step to robot squat. Because it's you, exhausting. Yes. This is where it's gotten uh, bastardized is because uh, certain coaches out there realize that they could exhaust their athletes really quickly by combining power movements with fatigue and conditioning and it becomes something else it becomes oh, something else but what it's, but again back to my point of like what power is is the greatest expression of all these other things and so if that's the point of that then you would want to completely gather all that before you would express all that and so this idea of doing it to fatigue is so ridiculous because stability goes out mobility starts to go out strength starts to go and, out because of fatigue starts to set in, in fact like, i'll add this right. one of the biggest mistakes with people with power training is that they'll do a workout and then do power exercises at the end no your power training, if you're going to do a full workout of other stuff, yeah. is at the beginning. Yeah, when you're fresh. Not at the end. Do not train power at the end of your strength training workout when you're tired. Now I'm going to go do some you know, box jumps. No, no, no. Start that way. Then you can move on to strength or mobility or whatever. But you don't want to do this under fatigue. Otherwise, you're not training the ability to contract quickly. 
You just train the ability to contract repeatedly over time, which is stamina. Nothing wrong with that. But if we're trying to develop power, that's not the way to do it. Mm. Lastly is agility or speed. Now, agility really is about being able to be fast and stable and strong um, and have power, but also be comfortable applying it through your skill or technique. This is when you have put everything together and now you're on the field and you move quick or slow, you speed up, you slow down, you rotate, and it all feels like it's on a dime. And that's uh, speed training. Maybe the the greatest equalizer in all sports, wouldn't you say? Oh, mm -hmm. speed kills. Right? Yeah. So speed yes. is, speed makes up for the Every, lack of everything else, I feel like. You cannot be the, the strongest the guy. rises to the top. It's you can, always the fastest. You may not be the so. most powerful. You may not be the most athletic. You may not be the most skilled but boy, if you have lightning speed, um, you just you set you separate You're yourself. An asset. I mean, Tyreek is an example of this, right? Like that's somebody who plays for the Dolphins, used to play for the Chiefs. Like seeing him play at that speed, yeah. You know, and I don't know, Sal, you probably don't know this. I don't even know if you know this, Justin. That they they're right now they're talking about changing this rule in the NFL about allowing him to be in motion. And this rule is is on the table what? because of him. Because they put him in motion. Well, he's so the he fastest guy in the NFL, so right? He's already gaining so he momentum. so they put him in motion, which has mm -hmm. always been a part of football. Mm -hmm. You know, you motion the quarterback drops does a stomp and then sends a wide receiver to mm -hmm. the other side. And it's a strategy for the quarterback to see are they in a zone or man to man because they'll see if the guy moves across. And but what they have found is that like and they hacked into this with Tyreek is that he's so fast it's already so hard to defend him. Then if you give him a little bit of a, it, head, start. a head start and then they hike the ball as he's getting ready to go back in a position, so he's already in half speed already mm -hmm. when they hike. So then he's in full speed almost instantaneously and he just blows by everybody. And it's like it's becoming he's become so dominant because of that <laughs> that they like they're up they're trying to decide like is this going to be like a rule that we have to put in place that they have to <laughs> like gets stationary again before you can hike the ball because wow. of how fast, wow. how much of a different speed you can make. Wow. Well, look, if you want ideas on how to program this kind of stuff into your workouts in combination with practice or not, if you're off season, we have a program called MAPS Performance Advanced. This is specifically designed, this program specifically designed to develop these attributes and more. There's also a customizable section in there to help people either develop grip strength, to develop rotational speed and power, general power, um, to develop stamina or conditioning. Lots of different skills that you can uh, put in and customize into this program. And if you're listening to this episode when we drop it, these are the final hours of the new launch of this program and its sale. So you can get it for $80 off, plus we'll throw in two eBooks for free. There's a grip strength reference guide and eat for performance guide that will include. So if you go to mapsp2.com, Use the code PA Launch. You'll get the eighty dollars off plus the two free eBooks. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump to Stefano, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.